Well, good evening. Welcome to Lion Lexington Mennonite Church. Uh, it's a joy to be together tonight to celebrate the birth of our Savior. We look forward to some good music, uh, some good narrative, and uh, a chance to um, worship together. Let's pray. Father, we um, give you the glory for all that you've done uh, for each of us. Lord, for the opportunity to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Um, God, we thank you for uh, the songs that we can sing and the word that we can listen to and uh, the chance to worship together. Thank you that you came to provide life for all of us and uh, a chance for us to uh, be together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Begin our singing this evening by turning, if you're using the hymnal, you can turn in the blue hymnal to number 131, 131. And let's stand to sing. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. circumstances around us seem bleak, we place our hope in Christ alone. As we relight our second Advent candle, the candle of peace, we are thankful for Jesus, who came as the Prince of Peace. His coming to our world makes it possible for us to experience the peace of God in our lives here and now and to reconcile us to God through his death on the cross. Now we relight our third Advent candle, the candle of love. It was because God loved the world, he sent his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We are grateful for the love of God, which is indeed far greater than tongue or pen can ever tell. Our fourth Advent candle is the candle of joy. As we relight this candle, our hearts are filled with the joy that comes from knowing Jesus, our Savior, and the Savior of the world. We know that happiness comes and goes, but God's joy produces within us a contentment that transcends momentary pleasures. And so, now on Christmas Eve, we light the center candle, the Christ candle. We pray that Jesus would always be the center of our worship. Of all that we do, 
of all that we live for. We celebrate the birth of the one who is indeed the light of the world, the word made flesh, the one who has come that we might have life and life to the fullest. This Christmas, may we all experience the hope, peace, love, and joy of Jesus as we together, we celebrate his birth. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the hope that is in Jesus Christ. We know that without you, our hearts are empty and our world is dark. We give you thanks for the peace of Christ that surpasses all human understanding. We acknowledge that there is little hope of peace when men and women keep you out of their lives. We are grateful that it is now possible to be at peace with you and with our fellow men. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that overflows in our hearts this Christmas season because of the birth of Jesus. We are thankful for the love that caused Jesus to come to our planet as a baby, to live a perfect life, and to take our sins to the cross that we might have eternal life. As we con continue in this celebration of worship, may we each experience anew the hope, peace, love, and joy that comes from knowing the Christ child whose birth we celebrate tonight. Amen. Tonight we are gathered together to celebrate God's greatest gift to us, the birth of his son Jesus and our Savior and Redeemer. For many years, the Israelites were looking for the Messiah, their Redeemer. They longed for a Savior. Some envisioned a king like David. Some believed he might be a leader like Moses or like the prophet Elijah. How would they know when their Savior and Redeemer would come? In Psalms 130, we read, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from their sins. Come, thou long-awaited Jesus, born to set thy people free.
It was the prophet Micah who foretold the birthplace of the Messiah many years before it happened. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clan of Judah, out of you will come forth one who will be ruler over Israel. O little town of Bethlehem, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Come to us as a helpless baby. It was an angel who told Mary to name the baby Jesus. Mary was the first to hear that name. Name that came from heaven above. Name that raises souls from darkness. The name that sets the prisoner free. The name that gives sight to the blind. And there is no other name given to men by which we must be saved. The wonderful name of Jesus.
God chose to first announce the birth of his son Jesus to lowly shepherds who were tending their sheep outside the village of Bethlehem. said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for today. In the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. There shall the child lie in the stable, this child who shall redeem us all. How great our joy, great our joy. Let's stand for this one. Oh, 
may be seated. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. what they had been told 
about the child. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. <clears throat> for our sins and becoming our Redeemer. In 1 Peter 1.18, it reads, You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Just like the lambs sacrificed at the temple on the altar of sacrifice had to be without blemish or defect, Jesus became the sacrificial lamb for us without blemish or defect, lying down his life and shedding his precious blood, thereby atoning for our sins. What amazing love! What redeeming love! <laughs>
gift giving is an important part of Christmas, as was true for the fourth wise men. You probably never knew there was a fourth wise man. You were always taught there were only three. The reason you never heard of the fourth wise man is because he really blew it on the gift-giving end. He was refused admittance to see Jesus because of his gift. He brought a fruitcake. That's how fruitcake got its bad reputation, the fourth wise man. You know what it's like to see a gift under the tree with your name on it. You've been snoopy. You can tell a little bit by the size and the shape of the package. It's got your name on it. You have a very good idea what's in that package. When nobody's looking, you shake it and you weigh it. And you can imagine the benefit that you'll get from that gift when it is finally unveiled. In your mind, you're already using it. In your mind, you're already reaping the benefits of that gift. But it is only when it is unwrapped, when the true contents of the box uh, are revealed that you know with certainty you've gotten the gift that you anticipated. I heard of a creative family that had two kids, and what they did, they had, let's say it was Johnny and Susie, all of Susie's gifts they labeled with Johnny's name, and all of Johnny's gifts they labeled with Susie's name, and can you imagine when they sat there to open the gifts and Johnny realized that everything he'd been shaking and holding and trying to guess were really Susie's gifts and his were marked uh, with her name on it. Christmas was the unveiling of God. It was God unwrapping and giving us a clear picture of who he is. The writer of the Hebrews says it this way. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being sustaining all things through his powerful word. Dear friends, that is the clearest communication God has ever given. In the former days, he spoke through prophets. In these last days, he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Jesus said it, during his ministry, more than once, you read it in the Gospels. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. S.D. Gordon put it this way, Jesus is God spelling himself out in a language that we can understand. The biggest problem you and I have is that our sin has alienated us from God. Sin cannot be removed with the stroke of a pen. 
Forgiveness and salvation cannot be given from afar off or in an impersonal fashion. Sin cannot be dealt with by a word of sympathy, especially from one who knows nothing of its anguish. God needed to enter our world face our temptations, carry our sorrows, and bear our sins on the cross. In one glorious verse, the Apostle John describes the way God provided for us in that manger. John 1.14, the word became flesh, made its dwelling among us. Uh, Eugene Peterson translated that in his message, God pitched his tent in our neighborhood. The idea of God dwelt among us is rooted in the Old Testament tabernacle days when God would His presence was in the tabernacle. And so John says, God tabernacled amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, the one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You need that balance. There are people so full of grace they wouldn't know truth if it hit them over the head. There are some that are so concerned with truth and dogma that there isn't an ounce of grace in them. Jesus came a perfect balance of grace and truth. I still go back to the way Max Lucado described it in one of his earlier books. The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. He came not as a flash of light, not as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. Were it not for the shepherds, there would have been no reception. Were it not for a group of stargazers, there would have been no gifts. Angels watched as Mary changed God's diaper. The universe watched in wonder as the Almighty learned to walk. Children played with him in the streets. It all happened in one moment when the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God became one of us. God lived among us. God revealed himself to us. And Jesus was full of grace and truth. The truth part is that sin has separated us from God. The good news of the gospel is that God provided the way back to God. The way back that was all lost in the Garden of Eden. And that's the grace part. And really, there are two kinds of grace there is common grace, and there is Redemptive grace, saving grace. The common grace every one of us here is experiencing now. 
the life in your body, the breath in your lungs, the gift of another day, uh, your family, your friends, your spouse, your children, your relatives, life in general is common grace given to every man, woman, boy, and girl. Saving grace, redemptive grace, is limited, or common grace, remember, is limited in its duration. It is temporary. There is coming a day when common grace will end and you will need saving grace to redeem you for all time and all of eternity. God provided the way. The way for us to have our sins forgiven and to be assured that one day we will spend eternity with Him. That is saving grace. That is redemptive grace. The truth is, salvation is a free gift. But it can be rejected. It can be ignored. It must be received. According to Revelation 3.20, Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and knocks. When we hear his knock, when we hear his voice, we need to open the door of our hearts and invite Jesus in. Let me ask you tonight, have you ever done that? Have you ever received redemptive, saving grace? Was there a point in your life when you expressed your sorrow to God for your sin and asked Jesus to forgive that sin, to come into your life and to provide for you redemptive grace? If you've never done that, I would invite you to do that even now. Uh, private little conversation between you and God, uh, just asking him to come into your heart and birth his spirit in your life. If you need help with that, I'd be glad to talk with you or pray with you after we close. Uh, we're going to sing some familiar carols. We're going to do it by candlelight. And when the candles are just about all lit, we'll turn these lights out. Uh, it's best for safety if we stay seated. That way no one's hair gets caught on fire. A um, couple of people are going to come up and grab some flame from that center candle. They're going to make their way up this center aisle. And the trick to this is the lit candle stays straight up in the air and the unlit candle comes in. That way we can keep our custodian for another year and keep the wax off your lap and off the floor. So when they bring the flame by, stick your candle in and pass it down the row and we will close out with some familiar carols.
Okay, let's carefully blow out our candles. And then we can stand for a closing prayer. Thank you, God, for sending your Son. Thank you that to us a child of hope is born. To us a son is given. And his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. God, I pray that your peace would accompany each of us as we go from this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.